So we're going to have fun. Uh, and uh, because you guys I've, want fun, right? I, as one of his uh, speakers for years, I, I worked for Bernie, and you have a great organization. And uh, it, it's a story of, uh, your story is that of an entrepreneur. Tell us how you decided to start Washington Speakers Bureau. What was the impetus? Because it made no sense. I will, I will do this quick because I know we want to talk about the election. I was uh, within, on the verge of my dream job. Nobody in my family ever went to college before. And I was young and I was 35 years old, about to become the athletic director at a major university. This is the only thing I wanted to do in my life. Somebody gave me a copy, a magazine, Fortune magazine, and in the magazine was an article about the Harry Walker Agency, which at the time was the largest lecture agency in the world. It's located right here in New York City. And in the article, the author recounts how Harry Walker walks into the White House and he signs Alexander Haig, Henry Kissinger, and Gerald Ford as clients. At the end of the article, um, Henry Kissinger is quoted as complaining about Harry Walker's high commission rate and says, why don't I sign with one of my, your competitors? And in it, Harry Walker says, I have no competitors. <laughs> so I took the article home and I left it on the coffee table. Uh, my wife picked it up a couple days later. She says, well, have you read this article? And she sat me down and she says, you know, you complain about the bureaucracy of university life. I don't think you'll ever be happy unless you do things on your own. She talked me into leaving my job and starting a speaker's bureau. There was no internet back then. We had no plan, no experience. I put a second mortgage on our home and now I had $55,000 of mortgages on a $60,000 house at 12% interest rate. <laughs> I had no money to get. You were the modern man. <laughs> or, or a smart wife because uh, I, we had uh, no money to get an office, so uh, a friend of mine said they'll rent us their stationary closet. Uh, his name was Chuck Hagel. He later became the Secretary of Defense. How and, much was the rent? Uh, I, you know, I honestly don't remember. My wife paid the bills, so. Yeah. so it sounds uh, like you did everything she suggested. I did. Uh, she's in the audience. I did yes. everything she suggested. Okay. <laughs> and. So you've got, you've got nothing, and you've, you've uh, bet the farm, and, uh, and then you got your first client, Steve Bell, right? And we, uh, I, I, I mean, how did that, I mean, the reason, I, the, uh, this book is not that big. Uh, uh, it is a terrific book. It's stories There's from a lot of people. words on each page. Yeah, no, but they're not too many. I mean, you can handle it. I'll bet Donald Trump could even read this book. <laughs> and what, what uh, this book is a handbook for how to live your life. Wow. And there are lessons in it. And there are real people, you know, Colin Powell, Tony Blair, uh, people you know and then people you ha have not heard of. And so how did you get this going? Well, you're nice to say that. I, I, the thing I'm proudest of, the fact that I think entrepreneurism in this country is the foundation of our economy. I think it what drives it, it what gives us the creativity. And um, I, I am such an opponent, proponent of it today. Uh, we sat in that closet for 12 months, nothing changed. We were in there for 14 months. Uh, Doing what? At, what did you do? And, uh, and we were virtually out of money. And when I got a phone call from a guy named Steve Bell, he was the anchorman for Good Morning America. Steve had been under written contract with another agency. And they didn't produce for him. And he says, I'll give you guys a chance. I shook his hand. Um, I later realized that I hadn't signed him to a written contract, which was standard for all the other agencies. Uh, that mistake on my part, I tried to justify to my wife that, you know, well, what good's it gonna do to sign him to a piece of paper if, if he's unhappy? Um, but it turned out to be a defining moment for us because Steve went back to his friends in Washington and would tell them, you know, 
you don't have to sign a written contract with these agencies. <laughs> you can go sign a handshake on a handshake and walk away from these people anytime you want. And so suddenly we became very popular. Uh, I'd never want to get a house from you. <laughs> <laughs> you can have it on a handshake. No, but, that, but that's true. It in, 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 in it was trust in yep. this, I, I mean, in my, business, I often think and frequently say to get information from people, not just kind of the patter and the right. public relations veneer, you have to build that relationship of trust. Uh, you know, we, every speaker we've signed, presidents, prime ministers, all have been on a handshake since then. Um, you know, I haven't had a contract with a single person. Did anyone ever kind of then just walk away? No. Never. I had lawyers who questioned it and argued and tried to convince somebody not to do it. Uh, but once I told them that somebody preceding them did it, you know, I never had any problems with it. It built this, this, this idea of trust. And you do have to have contracts with people. You have them with vendors and employees because the government requires you to. But, but it kind of said in our company, you know, that, you know, these people are depending on us and I can, I want to, you know, follow through and, and do and live up to their expectations. And it was, a, it was an original successful idea that initially you thought was a mistake. I did. My wife is responsible for the whole thing. Okay. She's, she is it. So now, let's, get, let's get to okay. the election because I know people are anxious. Tell me what just happened. <laughs> I, I have it written down here someplace. Uh, it, it's, uh, I, I think you kind of have to start with uh, where did Trump come from? And as he was uh, becoming more and more prominent uh, this year and it looked like he might get the nomination, I talked to lots of Republican friends. What happened? And uh, one Republican said, go get the transcripts of Rush Limbaugh's radio show, go back five years and read them. And I said, I'd rather die. <laughs> said, but if you read them, get somebody else to do it. So I got an assistant to look at it. And uh, what the story there is that Limbaugh and other conservative talk show host, and I, and I think lots of Republicans, but Limbaugh's the symbol of this, said uh, Barack Obama is an outrage, he's, he, he's unacceptable, he's uh, uh, just with this venom that Limbaugh has. But then if you look, you see Limbaugh has the same venom for the Republican leaders. John Boehner, the Speaker of the House, Senate Majority Leader, uh, Mitch McConnell. And he says, look, the, all these people collectively are betraying you. They are selling you out. And in comes Trump to fill that vacuum and say, I'm not part of that. This is a political establishment that is bipartisan and it is a bipartisan betrayal. And I, I think that gives uh, Trump uh, the momentum to start. But then I, uh, it was uh, five months ago, six months ago, a young reporter uh, at the Washington Post and I interviewed Trump. Uh, at, and we, he wanted to do it on the phone. So this is in the spring. And we said, no, we need to do it in person. So he. Uh, we did it in his new hotel. It was under renovation. The one in Washington. Uh, yeah, the one in Washington uh, down uh, the other important uh, Pennsylvania Avenue address. And uh, I, uh, there, there are a couple of things that struck me uh, it, during this hour and a half discussion. First, I've never met anyone who quite is as masterful at measuring the reaction to himself. He is, you know, how's this going over? He didn't say any of his crazy things really. Uh, but, he, but he did say, and this uh, floored me, he said, I br he's, with pride, I bring out rage in people. And uh, 
I thought when we published this, a long story, published the transcript, frankly, he would be done because people would know the president is not supposed to bring out rage in people. He is supposed to bring them together. We had a long discussion with him about how all successful politics is coalition building. When are you going to start building coalitions? And he kept saying, well, not yet, not yet. You know, someday everyone says I need to act presidential. And, uh, but he wasn't doing it. Uh, so then uh, I, I, I sent a copy of the transcript. Uh, and it, it was out there. People commented on it. I mean, one of the things that happened, we asked him, uh, well, there are two presidents in the Republican Party who are well known, Lincoln and Nixon. Why did Lincoln succeed? And so he said a few things and then he said, well, Lincoln succeeded because he did some of the things that needed to be done. Now I was at a university and asked the university president if somebody in this university gave that answer on an exam, <laughs> that Lincoln succeed, why did Lincoln succeed? Because he did some of the things that needed to be done. The president said, I said, what grade? He said, a D minus, minus, minus. He's missing some, missing some details. Why? And he said, well, because there's been grade inflation. <laughs> <laughs> so why did Nixon fail? And he said, well, Nixon failed because of his personality. I'm sorry, I couldn't help but say, yeah, but there were the crimes. And, and Trump said, oh, yeah, that too. Uh, so, I, I, you know, it was one of these things that was so unusual. So I sent it to uh, my psychiatrist friend, one of the <laughs> renowned psychiatrists in the country. What do you think? And he said, well, I, I can't give a diagnosis. I have not treated or met. Mr. Trump. I said, well, you've seen him on television. Read the transcript. So he called me back and said, okay, I'm going to tell you what I think, but if you ever tell anyone my name, I will kill you. <laughs> not a, so we're not going to say the name. Tonight. So we're not going to say the name. Uh, a, a deep shrink, <laughs> we'll call it. <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, and because, uh, bec uh, he said, look, this, this is a level of self-focus that I almost have never seen in a patient or anybody else. And he had a, a, a diagnosis for it, but I'm not going to, I'm going to keep that off the record also because it, it, it's too uh, repeatable, but it is a level of self-focus uh, in narcissism, which I think I've rarely seen. And then he said, over the decades, I've had, I think, eight patients who had this problem. And uh, I treated them for years. And in four cases, years and years of treatment. And I barely moved the needle on their behavior. Then he said, in the case of the other four, treated them for years. and. They moved the needle on my behavior. Wow. Yeah, wow. That says it all. I mean, the, what Trump has come with a velocity and fierceness. Now, when, when, he was, when he was running before the election, everybody was saying how outrageous he was and how he was totally out of control. He wasn't paying attention to the smart people that were running his campaign. He was firing people. Uh, he was bringing people in and out. He, he wasn't inclusive. He wa there was no establishment people that really, uh, Ryan in Congress was, you know, couldn't support him. Um, and now, now people are looking at him like, wow, what this, this genius knew what he was doing all along. It's kind of hard to put the two together and make sense of it. Yeah, yes, that's a fair point. And uh, I, what, happened is it, it was seen by lots of people, people, you know, it's well described, uh, people angry, but people feel cheated, feel they didn't get a part of uh, the money and the 
the period of growth in the country that the elite has received and the 1 percent and the 10 percent. And it, it, it's, it's really a fair point. And, this, and what people say, they want change. Uh, I, I've talked to lots of people about why Trump and uh, someone who's a, a worker in Maryland, I said, why Trump? And he said, well, he'll change things. And, and I said, but aren't you worried? And he said, and this is interesting, he said, oh, checks and balances will keep him in line. The Constitution will prevent Trump from doing things that are over the line. And I think, I think a lot of people had that feeling. And the reporting, the reporting before the election was saying just the opposite. They would say he would ruin the Constitution, he would ruin the White House, you know. Uh, so but, and people didn't believe it, I guess, right? No, no, clearly a plurality that won the Electoral College for him did not believe it. And the question now is, has the enormity of, and you see this, a new chief of staff appointment, uh, the Republican National Committee chairman, right. somebody very much from the establishment uh, is gonna get the key job yep. in the administration. Uh, you look at Trump and I think there's a sense of, when he was in the Oval Office with Obama, it was kind of like, wow, this isn't a casino. <laughs> <laughs> And I think there was a, a bit of uh, humility, respect for Obama. He said very nice things about Obama. I think it's dawned on him that the weight of the world is on him. And uh, it is. And uh, how he's going to do, you know, what, uh, you know, it, we don't know. I, I think if, and, and this was a problem I had with him and Hillary Clinton. We didn't know, and we don't know what's inside. What's that driver? I mean, in your right. book, you, uh, I think, very wisely single out the turning points in people's lives. And the turning points, you, you need to uh, identify them for yourself, right. don't you? Yeah, the, I mean, the turning points, we all have turning points. They're like um, a fork in the road, you know, where we decide to go one way or the other way, and we don't... And in the case of Trump, it's both. <laughs> well, <laughs> Yogi, Yogi Berra said, uh, you know, I, I get to a fork in the road and I take it. Yes, well... So, <laughs> you know... <laughs> it's happened. It's, so, um, but you're right. I, I posed the question in introducing you is, you know, what are the turning points in Trump's life? What, what are those... What has he been influenced by? What are those powerful influences? What are... What's he been defined by? What has he, you know, I've been able to recognize people who had defining moments or, you know, but I mean, do, do any of us really know what those turning points in his life and is he capable of learning from them? I know he, for, for two or three days now, he stayed off Twitter, but is it gonna change? I mean, or are we just in kind of a, a lull until he goes back to doing what he was doing before. See, this is one of the problems I have with my <clears throat> business with journalism, that we try to predict the future, and it's a fair question, fair series of questions. And the answer is, we just do not know. And uh, I am worried that people are who don't like him and have list, listened to all the things he said. I mean, he has said sexist, racist things. He has said things that are outside the border of normal American politics. People are so outraged and they kind of, instead of just attacking him, they attack the people who voted for him. They, they, um, David Remnick in The New Yorker uh, said, I mean, let me just read this to you. I mean, I was, jolted by this. David Remnick, one of the great journalists of our era, used to work at the Washington Post, runs a uh, brilliant magazine, and he, he wrote a, a day after the election a long piece about a, a, a this, and he said the electorate, this plurality, has decided to live in Trump's world of vanity, hate, 
arrogance, untruth, and recklessness, his disdain for democratic norms is a fact that will lead inevitably to all manner of national decline and suffering. I mean, that not only has he written Trump and uh, Trump's voters off, he's kind of written part of the country off. We're going to have uh, no... Now, I, I think we have to and my business and uh, citizens uh, be very aggressive, account of, make him accountable for everything he does, dig into it, the tax returns, we should still get some answers on that. Uh, but I think we can't kind of say, gee, half the electorate voted for him, so they are signing up for this world of hate, arrogance, untruth, vanity, and I, I, I just don't believe that. I no. think that has not, I mean, what do you think? Well, I, I don't think we can look at it that way. I mean, I, whether you're disappointed or you were a Trump supporter, you know, you can't, you can't look at the rest of your life and think that, uh, you know, that we aren't gonna hold it all together. I mean, we've held it all together through, uh, a civil war, which uh, by all rights should have torn us apart as a country. If that wasn't going to tear us apart, uh, and, and, and the other assassinations and things that have happened to this country, if that, those things aren't going to tear us apart, I have a hard time believing that Donald Trump is going to do it. You know, I just don't want to give him that much credit that he can ruin the, the fabric of this country. Well, the, the, do you think he wants to wreck the country? I no, don't. I, I don't. I, 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 think I simply he, think he didn't. I simply think, I don't think he knew what he was doing. I mean, yes, yes, I think, I think he deserves all the credit in the world for somehow tapping into legitimately. I mean, you know, when, when, we all travel the country, but when you walk, when you go into rural America and you leave New York City for parts of New York or Boston, parts of Massachusetts, you do see a decline in the rest of the country. You, you do worry about that and you, you do feel- The condition of you, the country is the central driving factor, yeah. I think. I mean, I saw it. My, my father was, grew up in a two room house and with five sisters, a brother, assorted relatives and a mother living in two rooms and in the poorest of mining towns in West Virginia. So, you know, I, I'm aware of the despair and I guess that's what he tapped into. The sad thing is, the sad thing is, it is all the politicians' fault. Nobody has been there to say, except for Simpson and Bowles, who came up with, I think, a great plan, you know, with balancing the budget and, and kind of taking care of the deficit. But name somebody who has done, who has said, I'm just going to change things. You know, we make promises to people, and they're rarely kept. Well, that's true, but I, I think the, uh, the real uh, issue is going to be what he does. Right. Uh, and it's going to define a lot. I had a piece in the Washington Post uh, today. Before you yes. say anything, let me yeah. bring that out, because oh. I want to read, if I can find it, I want to read something that you wrote. Uh-oh, this, now this, this, is, um, this is evidence of trouble for me. This uh, scared me, actually. Um, there is a, um, there's an intelligence briefing that's coming up. For him. It, it, the, the piece was what uh, the secrets that right. Trump is going to now get exposed to. So let me to. read the opening of your piece in the paper today. One of the most important phrase, phases of the transition to power for President-elect Donald Trump includes briefings on U.S. intelligence capabilities and secret operations, as well as separate descriptions of the extraordinary powers he will have over the military, especially contingency plans to use nuclear weapons, according to officials. In, in 2008, after then-President-elect Obama was given one sensitive intelligent briefing at a secure facility in Chicago, he said, it's a good thing there are bars on the windows, because if they weren't, I'd be jumping out the window. Yeah. That's sobering. Yeah, it's sobering, and uh, what uh, the theme here is, and I think the theme of the last 20 or 30 years is that there is an increasing concentration of power in the presidency. I think uh, Obama has much more power than even George W. Bush had, and Bush did 
has more power than they Clinton. all push the envelope. Yeah, yeah, and the, and, and the uh, it's handed to them right. by the Constitution, by uh, the laws we have. But Trump is going to get not only the most sensitive sources and methods information, he is also going to get the covert action briefing, which is given to presidents and cabinet officers and very few people in Congress about the actions undertaken by the CIA to change the world without the U.S. hand being known. Right. I mean, I, as, a, as a citizen, I'm certainly, I lived in Washington for 30 some years and I'm certainly aware of- You never got the covert action briefing? I got the book, but I never read it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, not out. Um, it's, it's so top secret, uh, you, know, you know, it wasn't even in Hillary's you know, emails. We, <laughs> yeah. It could have been. Yeah, yeah, but it, it, wasn't. it wasn't. So let me, uh, now that you bring that point okay, up. Okay, but the third briefing, and, the, oh. and this is the one that uh, under the Constitution, the president is the commander in chief. He can employ the U.S. military any way he wants. I remember talking to a group of academics a number of years ago when George W. Bush was president, and I said, so he can start a war. And I, oh, they said, oh no, Constitution very clearly says Congress will declare war. And I said, but that's not the way it works. We haven't had a declared war since World War II. They would not hear of it. And I said, look, George W. Bush can invade Mexico tomorrow if he wants, and somebody stood up in the back in agony and said, don't give him any ideas. <laughs> but there is that concentration of power. And as it uh, pertains to nuclear weapons, uh, Trump will have that military aid with the football, right. uh, which has an authentication code codes in it so they can send out a message and make sure it's coming uh, from the commander in chief. But there's also a black book called Presidential Decision Handbook that lists all the options for nuclear war targets, target packages, what can be done, including estimates of casualties, 100 million. The reality is that a president, Obama now has that authority, can do it all on his own if there's a surprise attack or a mistake uh, he could respond and there, no one else would be involved. No one else consulted. The president and that military aid with the, uh, with the football. Uh, so it, uh, it, now, the purpose of that is to act as a deterrent, not to use it. But Trump's gonna have that power. And I think when he gets that briefing, I've heard from presidents actually who've received the briefing who said it's the, it was the worst day of their life almost. Well, that's what Obama was yeah. saying. Yeah, he you just know said that. it's, it is. So Trump is entering a world uh, like he's never seen before. And he will be the one, he will be the decider and the commander in chief on these things. So, uh, you know, does he have the capacity to make sure he sets up a system in the White House and the military and so forth so he protects right. all of us? Yeah. It's his job. He's the, he's the protector in chief. Your piece, your piece worried me because, you know, you just, you, you don't know. I mean, you know, we've gone, it's kind of hard for us to take, we, you know, 10 days ago, he was an idiot. And today, you know, he's going to be president-elect of the United States. And this isn't like, it's not like, Ron, you know, I represent Ronald Reagan. And, and this is not like Ronald Reagan when, in 1980 when they said, well, he's an actor. How can an actor, you know, be president of the United States? This is different. This is, this is different. And how did you find Reagan, by the way? Because this is an important part of your story for uh, the Washington speech. Well, the, the, reason, the reason that I think character and, uh, and these turning points are so important 
1989, we were one of 30 agencies competing for Ronald Reagan, and we were really- As he was leaving the president. As he was leaving office, and we were, you know, still very, you know, small. And uh, somehow we just got invited. And there were a lot, not only the big agencies on the East Coast, but there were Hollywood agencies because he was an actor. And so you, the idea was that they would take 30 agencies and after the first interview, whittle it down to 15, and then the third interview, whittle it down to seven. And then the president, Mrs. Reagan, would choose the top, uh, they would present them with the top two people and President Reagan would choose them. And it, in Washington, D.C., if you want to know something, you just have to call somebody. I mean, it's, it's, it, I can find out almost anything by picking up the phone and, and calling somebody. Except and, that covert action briefing. Right. Okay. But I have your article okay, now. If you so get it, I'll be let asking me know, you later. You? Uh, so um, it went dark in, Wa in Washington for about two months, and, um, and I got a call. I got a call from Fred Ryan, who's now publisher of your paper, and he the was Washington the Washington Post. Right, and he was the chief of staff. And I thought, okay, I said, brace yourself because he's just going to tell us we lost, and boy, you guys did a really good job. And he said, President and Mrs. Reagan selected you, they want you to represent them. And I was so uncertain of what to say that I thanked him very much and hung up the phone. And, uh, and I turned out to be, and I said to Paula, I said, Your wife, Paula. Yes, I said, don't tell anybody this because this was a mistake. They're going to say, my God, you guys called the wrong telephone number. Got to call them back, and we're going to get a call saying, I'm sorry, you did do a good job, but you weren't selected. So the next day, we got a call saying, yeah, reconfirming that we represented him. So I was still superstitious enough not to ask. And this is the amazing story because I asked about, a year later, after we had done a pretty good job, I said to Fred, you know, how did this all take place? And he said, actually, you came in second. You weren't the top choice of the staff. And President Reagan chose you because he wanted to help. He saw you as a company trying to do something good, and he wanted to help you along. And I was, you're, you're amazed. You almost don't believe it. And but. After I got to know him, you come to realize that he was a small time guy, small town guy, who believed in entrepreneurism and he believed in those things so much that he would trust his legacy to us where we were inexperienced, thinking, you know, we could easily do something to, to ruin that legacy or at least put tarnish on it. And, and, uh, and he trusted us, and it was Why? one of those. Why? Just because, just because he, he believed in helping people, and, and he said that, you know, I want to give you a hand. And the, and the agency that came in first was a big agency that, that would have been better off handling them than we, than we would have. Yeah, did you ever talk to him about why did you pick us? Well, he just said I th he, would, he would be humble enough to say, I thought you guys would do a real good job. I, Fred Ryan was the one who told me that he did it because he wanted, you know, he believed in, in, in helping us. Yeah, in in uh, your book, there are so many fascinating personal stories. I, I, I particularly like the one about Rudy Giuliani, who was one of your clients also. And he, Giuliani, in the book, reveals, at least it was new to me, that he had decided after high school to become a priest. He was already accepted. And, and he was going right. and uh, headed to seminary. And then he went to the beach and saw a girl in a bikini <laughs> and decided, maybe I don't want to be a priest. Right. Now, if we'd only known that, how easy it was to deter Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> Imagine what we could have done with uh, yeah. beachwear. Uh, I, I, I mean, that, that, but that was surprising. And he then was, he, he, he fooled around with it. He was thinking about it, and he, he always had struggles. I think, yeah. you know, his his father had been in jail. His father was a prize fighter. Um, you know, encouraged Rudy to be a prize fighter. His mother, on the other hand, was very moral. She 
there's a story that where she um, got the wrong change from a teller at a bank, a, a young lady, and um, came home, discovered the mistake, and it was pouring rain, and she dragged Rudy back to the bank to give the girl her money back, and it turned out that this was the third time this lady had made a mistake, and she would have been fired. Yeah, I read that back. story, and I so, was skeptical. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> the Rudy Giuliani, well, I mean, we all know, would have taken the hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> right, but I, I, he was only three or four years old. Give him a chance. <laughs> <laughs> well, things uh, things like this start early. But you know, he he was. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, I mean, this is, but uh, I mean, just, uh, I, I wanted to tell a, a story um, that illustrate, I, I think, and I think it applies to the time we're going through, which is a political convulsion. I mean, all uh, businesses, all the media is going through a convulsion, the economy is clearly, uh, foreign relations, that you sit at a certain time and it may not actually be the way you're pretty confident it is. And this goes back to September 1974. Uh, Gerald Ford was president. Nixon had resigned the month before and, and Ford had been president 30 days. And Surprisingly, Ford went on television on a Sunday morning and announced he was giving Nixon a pardon, full pardon for Watergate. And uh, I think F Ford went on television early on a Sunday morning hoping no one would notice. <laughs> but it was noticed, but not by me. I was asleep. I was here in New York, in fact, and my uh, colleague Carl Bernstein called me and woke me up. I said, have you heard? I said, what? I, I've heard nothing. And <clears throat> Carl, who truly has the ability, he then did, still does, to say what occurred in the fewest words with the most drama, said, the son of a bitch pardoned the son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm proud to tell you that, um, you know, that um, I even got it. I figured out what had happened. And at the time I thought, oh, it's the perfect corruption of Watergate. Nixon gets a pardon. There was an aroma of some sort of deal with Ford. And 40 of Nixon's aides go to jail. And uh, it, it, I, I, there was something fitting about it being the ultimate corruption. And I thought this for a long time. I, I, Generally, the history books show that in two years after that, in 1976, Ford ran against Jimmy Carter and lost because of the suspicions about the pardon. And then 25 years later, I undertook uh, an examination of the legacy of Watergate in the presidencies of Ford through Clinton. And I'd never met or interviewed Gerald Ford, called him up. And expecting there'd be a wall. I said, I'd like to talk about the pardon. He said, sure. Gerald Ford turned out to be the most honest, open politician I ever encountered in Washington. So I had the luxury of time, get the legal memos, read everything. I'd go interview Ford in New York when he was here at a board meeting, his home in Colorado, his main home in Rancho Mirage, California, and just did. What happened here? Why? And I remember the last interview with him. And uh, I said, you know, why'd you pardon Nixon? And he said, you keep asking that. And I said, I, I don't feel I have the full story. And he said, okay, I'm going to tell you. I've not told Betty, his wife, this, but I'm going to tell you what happened. And he said, it's precisely this. Al Haig, who was Nixon's chief of staff, a week before Nixon resigned, came to me and said, if you guarantee you'll pardon Nixon, Nixon will resign, offered a deal. Ford said, I rejected that deal outright. I knew it would be corrupt, and, and he said, and he was correct, said, I was going to become president anyway. Nixon was finished. The Republican Party had deserted him. And then 
Ford said in this plaintive voice, which I'll never forget, he said, look, I needed my own presidency. We had to get Nixon off the front page. I, I had a letter from the Watergate prosecutor saying they were gonna investigate Nixon as a private citizen. With all the taped evidence, he surely would be indicted, tried, convicted, probably go to jail. And Ford said, country couldn't stand it. I had to preempt the process. This was the only way to do it. And I wrote in the book that rather than this being an act of corruption, it was a very gutsy thing to do. Caroline Kennedy, the daughter of John F. Kennedy, called and said she and her uncle, Teddy Kennedy, had read what I had written in uh, the book, Shadow, and uh, agreed, and they're gonna, it said, we're gonna give Gerald Ford the Profiles and Courage Award for pardoning Nixon. Mm -hmm. And th I, I didn't go to the ceremony, but I've seen it. And there's Ford, somewhat vindicated, Teddy Kennedy, who in 74 called the, the pardon almost a criminal act, saying, it's Teddy Kennedy, I was wrong. And I'm watching this, and I tell you what a cold shower it was, because I was so sure 25 years earlier that it was the ultimate corruption. And then you relook at it, get the facts, time passes, and uh, what looks like corruption turns out to be courage. And how, uh, to be honest with you, how. Uh, humbling, even humiliating it is to know I was so wrong. And so we now look at things or we look at events and we say it's this way, this is the way it is it, it's going to be. And maybe not, maybe we've got it wrong. And that's why I just think we have to kind of take the Trump presidency or time, the transition a little here and a little there and uh, report it very aggressively, but very honestly, and uh, s see what happens, because we might be wrong. I will say, you know, just as a novice looking at the general state of media, it is a shame that there are not more great journalists and investigative journalists like yourself, because... Yeah. Uh, no, but you see. No, but I mean, it is so true because this country would be, would be so much better for us to have as much information about our lives as possible. And maybe part of our, uh, our worry about what's happening in the country is that we just don't know. Yes, I, I think that's, I think we do not know yeah. what goes on. I think government has become more secretive. I asked Al Gore once after he'd left the vice presidency, what percentage of what went on in the Clinton eight years where you were vice president that's of consequence do we now know? And he said, 1%, and I, I died inside. And I said, well, suppose you wrote a tell-all biography. Then what percentage would we know of what went on of consequence? And he said, 2%. And it's hidden. Now, I think we know 60 or 70 percent, but sometimes a lot of the important things we do not know. And the judge who said it uh, got it right. Uh, democracies die in darkness yeah. if we don't know. Yeah, I agree with you. That's, that's the whole reason I brought that up, is the more we know, the better our democracy is. Even if it's hard. Or okay. People in the audience have a few questions. Um, how do you walk the line of trying to advocate for what you know is right while presenting information that is non-biased in a non-biased format? Just, uh, I mean, real quickly, because uh, you don't know what right is. The, uh, witness the, the pardon of Nixon by Gerald Ford. It, it looked corrupt and uh, turned out it was in the interest of the country. See, what Ford did there was in the national interest. It ended his, uh, 
essentially his presidency because he was not real, uh, not elected for the first time in, in 76. The, um, do you think the media played uh, a part in the nastiness of the recent election and what are the major differences now between coverage of modern presidents and past presidents? Uh, I don't think we made the uh, campaign nasty. I think it was nasty on its own. Uh, and a lot of the nastiness was just live. We saw it. Uh, I, think, uh, I, I think in many ways we did a good job telling people who the candidates are, but we missed this movement, the Trump movement, and people are going to be writing about it for years, trying to, dis you know, what really happened here? Why didn't we see this? I, I would get in a hair shirt on that, and I would blame uh, the media. I, uh, if, if I may just say this, I had the advantage of working for the Washington Speakers Bureau, going around the country giving speeches. And I had experience, I mean, that gets me out of the Washington bubble. And even, like I spoke to a group of uh, uh, construction contractors who had their meeting in Washington. And uh, I, talked about presidents and Obama and the campaign. I said, okay, how many for Hillary Clinton in this audience? Maybe 120. None. How many for Trump? Every hand, and in some cases, two hands went up. I went to other, I had other experiences. Uh, went down to Texas to give a speech. Tony D'Amelio, your former uh, top agent has set up his own firm, uh, DeMil the D'Amelio Network, and I work for Washington Speakers Bureau and him, and he sent me down to Texas to give a speech to 400 people who run and communications uh, and manage one million office buildings in this country. Can you imagine? I didn't know there were that many office buildings, but there are. And they, and I asked this group, I said, okay, how many uh, for Hillary Clinton? And 10 people raised their hand. How many people for Trump? Hundreds. The CEO who's worked with these people day and night knows them, came over and sat down and said, my head is spinning. I know these people, I love these people. He was not a Trump supporter. And if you told me hundreds of them are for Trump, I would not have believed it, but there it is. And so there was a lot of covert support for him. And I said on television many times, there's this secret Trump support. You think that was part of the problem of, of not recognizing this was going to happen is the fact that reporters stay in their bubble of Washington or stay in the bubble of New York and they don't go out of the office and, and you know, careful, you could, you could buy into that. Hillary Clinton could have bought into the fact that, you know, this is just going to be easy. You know, I'm going to criticize Trump and, and uh, walk away with it. I think that's, uh, that's what That's the way happened. journalism has changed, I guess, a little bit, right? Uh, uh, yes. I mean, you've got to go knock on the doors, and we should have, I should have more. I should have got, you know, this, this go into the night or the day and listen to people. What do you think was your biggest mistake, and what did you learn from it? Oh, well... Being I mean, up here I, with I, me? I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, uh, I, I think the Ford being so sure that it was corrupt and being 100% wrong about something that a president did, he could not go public and say Al Haig came and offered a deal because then Haig would have been criminally charged and uh, it would have just uh, I mean, it would have been a disaster for Ford at that time. And so he kept it secret, but he did what was right. I th but I think uh, so many mistakes I've made. I mean, I'll keep, I would keep people here all night if I started listing them. Can uh, Trump create jobs? Yeah, that's a great question, isn't it? You know who creates jobs? Uh, private industry. 
How many people does Washington Speakers Bureau now hire? Almost 100. Yeah, okay. So that came out of uh, entrepreneur right. vision. And uh, the, you know, I, anyone here remember the 1991 movie that Robin Williams was in, Dead Poets Society, where he plays a subversive uh, faculty member at this boys' uh, prep school. There are lots of great scenes in that movie, but in uh, that movie, uh, in his classroom at one point, he just gets up and stands on his desk, and he says, I stand on my desk to remind myself that we need to find new ways to think about things. That's you. That's the entrepreneurs. If Trump can create that spirit and give incentives to people, uh, I think he can create jobs. I think he could also risk jobs. So it's, it's a perilous I think you're right. Time. I mean, part, part of what, you know, people, I could have given up easily quicker than we did. Um, and I think people today, it, you know, what worries me is about youth is that, you know, maybe we make it a little too hard to start our own business. You know, we've got too many regulations. You know, for me, it cost us $50 to register in Virginia. When we started today, I think, you know, it's thousands of dollars and you've got to sign papers and, 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 and adhere to certain regulations that, that I didn't have to, you know, to adhere to. And it, it does bother me that, you know, I think, I think the biggest thing, maybe for me on this election, the biggest thing was when I hear that our children aren't going to do better than we did. That's what bothers me. And if me. you ask them, that's what they say, too. Right. I mean, I, I, that's, I think that is one of the hardest things to, for me to take. That, you know, because my parents thought, you know, I was lucky to go to college. And if my parents still, even if I hadn't gone to college, felt I was going to do better than they did. And today, it's just harder. We, somehow, we've just made it harder for people to do that. Yeah. There's a... There's a story in the book that I wrote by Liz, Liz Murray. Oh, yes. Tell Liz, me. Liz, this, I mean, this is just totally inspirational to me. Is she uh, here? She is here. Is Liz here? Yeah. Stand up a minute. Yeah, yes. Just <laughs> Liz this Murray. This is a great story. Liz Murray's parents were addicted to heroin. Um, all of the money they had was devoted to the habit that they had. They were great people. Her, her father was a PhD uh, candidate, but he ju they just couldn't break the habit. Uh, they ended up getting HIV. Liz's sister went off to stay with uh, a grandfather who was somewhat abusive, and Liz decided not to, so Liz lived on the D train in New York City traveling up and down on the D train, missed several years of high school, lived, had her own community of people, we see them on the streets, uh, and got in her head this what if, what if I could change my life? What if I could get an apartment? What if I could get my sister back? And tried to get back into high school and nobody would admit her back again because she'd missed so much time. They said, just get a GED degree. She found she had one last appointment with a high school. It was a decision. She only had enough money to decide, I'm going to go get pizza with my friends or I'm going to go to this one last appointment. All of them have been failures. So, but that one what if in her head kicked in and she went there found, it was called um, uh, PrEP, what was it, first PrEP? Humanities. Humanities PrEP. It was started by a, uh, a guy named Perry who wanted to take kids who were failing and put them all in a school to give them, concentrate on them more. Liz ended up graduating and going to Harvard and graduating from Harvard. <laughs> I should, have, I should have said that before, before I had her stand up, but it's just an incredible story of what we can all do if we, if we just pay attention to 
the turning points in our lives and, and work hard. And that goes back to entrepreneurism or what else, whatever else we want to do in life. I think that's right. All right, let's go back let's to, to you because that's more important. Parallel Trump and Nixon. Uh, easier to uh, describe the creation of the universe. <laughs> All right, listen. I mean, it, it's, it's uh, you know, Trump is about to become president. It's unfair to compare him to Nixon. Do we get I rid mean, of Nixon the... Nixon was such a criminal. You listen to, uh, and Nixon was a hater. You listen to enough of those tapes, and it's raw hate. Let's use the IRS. Let's use the FBI, the CIA. Essentially use the power of the presidency for revenge on political enemies, real or perceived. And so, uh, you know, if, if Trump falls into that trap, we're in grave trouble. Yeah, but I think people in this country wouldn't tolerate it. Yeah, they, yeah. They just uh, wouldn't put up with well, it. Well, there is gonna be a kind of uh, scrutiny of Trump, yeah. uh, and, and there should be. Right. And uh, it's, but at the same time, I think, I, you know, if, if you go through the parade of horribles of things he did and proposed and so forth, it is uh, unimaginable. And uh, I guess out of whatever the, the goodwill is in the collective heart of America, people now, he was elected. Uh, the Constitution says he's commander in chief, and so uh, I, I very much think he is deserved, uh, entitled, and the country's entitled to that chance. But boy, it's got to be watched within an inch of its life. He he didn't win the overall vote, so do we get rid of the electoral college? Yeah, I mean. If every time this happens, people propose that, and then they move on to other things. Uh, Trump was just interviewed on 60 Minutes. I guess it, it played tonight. Uh, he said uh, that he didn't know the hate acts his supporters were committing. He, he told them to stop. Uh, would you comment? Yeah, I didn't see the interview. I'm sorry. No. We were here. <laughs> we were. Um, I guess that's it. Okay. Well, the, you know, the other thing is where this, I mean, you've, uh, in this book, uh, taken, you take the reader, as I say, it's this, it's really a handbook for how to live your life. You take the reader uh, and you get to see people like Les, you get to hear Colin Powell, you get to hear Tony Blair, you get to hear these uh, other figures, and uh, there is an introspective quality to it of, hey, let's, let's look at our lives, the turning points, the outcomes, what it means. And uh, what, as I try to take that introspective approach to the media, I think we've become lazy. I was talking to a reporter the other day, not at the Post, and I said, when you go out for an interview, and he, and he said, oh, I never go out for an interview. It's all done on the internet, on the computer, and of course that means you can call somebody and say, I want a response to this, and so then they can craft it and make sure they don't say anything spontaneously true. And, uh, <laughs> And he said, then sometimes I use the, have the intimacy of the telephone, but never person to person. And uh, I, was, I was thinking it w it's been about nine years since I went and knocked on someone's door at night who I wanted to interview, which is the, what Carl Bernstein and I did as young reporters all the time, knock on doors, knock on doors. Uh, build relationships of trust with people, hopefully. And uh, it, there was a general for the fourth Bush book I was working on who would not talk. Emails, no response, uh, telephone messages, even intermediaries. So I found out where he lived in the Washington area 
Now, when do you go see a four-star general when you don't have an appointment? When would you go? Never. N never, okay. But suppose you decide. Late I, at night. Pardon? Late at night. How late? Nine, 10 o'clock. Yeah, that's a little late. He might be asleep. <laughs> uh, 8.15 on a Tuesday is actually the perfect time because it's not Monday. Thanks. If it's, I ever do that, I'll, I'll okay. keep that in mind. If you do it, let me know. I'll come with you. And, uh, and so, uh, and you don't want to do it at the end of the week. 8.15, a general will have eaten, not gone to sleep, maybe had a drink or something like that. So I knock on the door and uh, he opened the door and he looked at me and he said, are you still doing this shit? <laughs> and he meant it. And I, 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 in the CIA, people have told me, they tell you, let the silence suck out the truth. And sometimes this, that's the case for journalists. So I just went poker face, no expression, didn't say anything. He looked at me and he got a disappointed look uh, on his face. I think not in me, but in, himself because after I think two, three seconds, he went, come on in, sat for two hours uh, and answered almost all the questions. Now why? And the answer is somebody showed up and we're not showing up. We're not showing up in Wisconsin or Michigan or Pennsylvania, where all these Trump voters were out there, were not showing up at uh, the homes or whatever is necessary to get the story from the uh, government officials. And we have a uh, government that is, as I was saying, increasingly secretive, that the message managers, you call the White House now and say, I want to do a story on the, something, and they will say, Oh, uh, why is that a story? Now, somebody like me can't normally be discouraged, but a young reporter just kind of getting along. I called the White House and the assistant press secretary says, why is that a story? And they can stop and choke off things or just not respond. And uh, we're, we're at, you, you have the Trump tendency toward secrecy, getting uh, non-disclosure agreements that are legally, he told us months ago, he said, oh, those are the great, I've had lawyers look at them and they're the most, they're, they're without flaw. There's no way somebody can go public who works for me who signs one of these things. It's not the way to run the government. And we asked, said, are you gonna get, if you become president, are you gonna get non-disclosure agreements from people in the White House, and he said, well, I might. Now that would be, yeah. that wouldn't work, or, or let's hope it doesn't work. All right, I have a, one last question. The, um, Colin Powell learned the importance of getting along with people growing up here in the Bronx, a place called Banana Kelly. Right. The street was Kelly, it was the shape of a banana. Uh, Alan Greenspan was a mu musical prodigy playing in a 1940s swing band who learned, who by happenstance learned that, Stan, that he was not ever going to be as good as his bandmate Stan Getz. And so he decided since he kept the taxes for the band that he would go and do that. Right, uh, and, and go and do finance and then right. became chairman of the uh, Federal Reserve. Right, Robert Reich who has now become the nation's foremost authority on economic equality, became that because a boy who protect, he's only four foot, 11 inches tall. And he was And was bullied, uh, bullied unmercifully right. as and a child. And the person who protected him growing up was brutally killed in Mississippi in the civil rights movement of the 1960s. And that totally changed his life. You became an investigative journalist as a janitor. <laughs> yes, it's true. Uh, and uh, I, in high school, worked as a janitor in my father's law firm. And you go down and you 
clean up at night when everyone's gone. And it, one night I said, well, let's look at the, what are these papers on the desk here? <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Oh, I, I go to, I'm in math class with that kid, uh, uh, with that, that, the father of that uh, kid. And then I started looking at the files. And then in the attic, they had what was called the disposed files of old files in alphabetical order and I would go up and I would look at the disposed files of people I knew in this small town, Wheaton, Illinois. And what was surprising and eventually became quite shocking is that you thought this was a perfect, this was Billy Graham's, she, he'd gone to college there, this everyone was uh, good and did the right thing. And then you s found in the disposed files that they had allegations of abuse, tax fraud, all kinds of things. And so there was the surface reality that seemed fine and really good. And then there was the disposed files. And that uh, was a propellant for me to s when, after I got out of the Navy, to say, well, in journalism, uh, in a sense, you're going after the disposed files in people's lives. Wow. And uh, it, it kind of all fit together. Now, sometimes it's not a bad story. Sometimes it's a good story. Uh, but um, it's... Uh, it's, it's interesting that you can connect all of these things, like Colin Powell in your book, one of your very best uh, clients on the speaking tour. He's still on the speaking tour, isn't he? He is. Very. One of my biggest regrets was when he was considering running for president. And I remember thinking, oh, I hope he doesn't run because I don't want to lose him as a client. <laughs> and. You know, and you think back at how stupid that was. I mean, how, how selfish it was, you know, because I think he would have made a great president. I got to know him the first Gulf War uh, when he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs and a uh, uh, remarkable man who Say, had the chance of being a really, uh, he was a great leader in the military. And of course, what he, I, the book I did, I wrote about how reluctant he was to go to war. And Newsweek excerpted the book on the cover and had a picture of him called The Reluctant Warrior. And one of the measures of somebody, in my view, uh, is how they deal with things that are uncomfortable. And it's difficult for a general to be called the reluctant warrior. And in Powell's memoir, he recounts how this was written about him in my book and the cover of Newsweek and said, so I was called the reluctant warrior, period. One word, guilty. <laughs> the, the, he is such an honorable person. I mean, the sad thing is, you know, I, he feels so bad about what took place when he went, went to the UN. And about I the hate, weapons of mass yeah, and destruction I, I hate in that. Iraq. I hate seeing that. He says that's what's going to be written on my tombstone. Yeah, but, but see, uh, again, that's a measure of his strength, that he can step up to that and say that I made that mistake. It was my fault. In one of my books, uh, Plan of Attack, I recount exactly what happened there. And essentially what happened is Bush called him and said, only you can sell this to the UN. Only you, Colin. And here is this, he was Secretary of State at that time, and he'd been in the military for God knows, you know, 35 years or whatever it was. And here's the commander in chief saying to him, only you can do it. So he went to the UN and put out that intelligence, which I, I'm convinced Powell believed, would, but turned out to be uh, inaccurate. And so, you know, what's, see, this is the thing, you, you, mistakes, you need to learn from them, grow, and uh, not be uh, debilitated by them. That's what, that's what turning points are. You, yeah. there are, you don't take that fork in the road, and sometimes you're going to take the right fork, sometimes you're going to take the wrong one, but learning from taking that wrong one is the difference between people you respect 
and people who are great leaders. So maybe in Ru Rudy Giuliani's future is the priesthood. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.